Das an. Okay, ja. Um, yeah. Uh, my name is Lars Schneider and um, I'm the technical lead for Git at Autodesk. And I'm also a Git and Git LFS contributor. And today I want to talk about Git LFS or how to handle large Git repositories. But first of all, let's discuss what is a large Git repository. Git repositories can grow large in different dimensions. And one of them is they can grow large by the number of files that they contain in their head revision. Um, why, is it, why is this a problem? Well, usually Git looks at every file in your repository in order to detect if you have changed that file. And um, if you have, let's say, more than 100,000 files in your repository, then this process starts to get a little bit slower. So Git is not as snappy as, as you know it. Um, there are several solutions to that problem. One that is already built in in Git is a concept of that's called sparse checkout. With sparse checkout, you would tell Git to only look at certain directories, so it would ignore others. Um, another approach to that problem was just recently introduced by Microsoft. It's called GVFS, uh, the Git Virtual File System. And GVFS basically turns this problem around instead of Git asking the file system uh, what has been changed, the file system more or less talks to Git and helps Git to figure out more quickly what files have been changed. And this way, Microsoft was able to handle Git repositories with millions of files um, in a very responsive manner. Another way how Git repositories can grow large is by the number of commits. Because many Git commands, they look at the history of your repository. For instance, um, the very popular git blame command that you can use to figure out who changed a certain line in your source code. But usually you, you don't run into this problem because you need at least 100,000 commits. That's what I've seen um, before you even notice um, a speed bump. And even, I mean, if I talk about speed bumps in git, that really means uh, it maybe takes half a second longer. <clears throat> But the real problem that I want to talk about today with large Git repositories um, is uh, or are large files. So why are large files a problem for Git? In order to make this a little bit more tangible, um, I want to use this 100 megabyte video file as an example. And let's, uh, let's take this file and see what happens when we put it into a Git repository. So here we have an empty Git repository. Just, uh, we just called git init and the size is just one megabyte, uh, zero megabyte, right? So we add a bunch of source code files here uh, that um, in total are roughly one megabyte and we add our large video file with 100 megabyte. We commit that change and after the first commit, our repository uh, grew to a size of 101 megabyte. Then we change our mind and we change the color of the video file. And we add that file and make just another commit. And this will add 100 more megabyte to our repository. Why is that the case? Well, a Git repository always contains every version of a file um, in the history. And, and that's why, um, yeah, the repository grew at this uh, by 100 megabytes because we have uh, the second version of the video file in our repository. And of course, this is also true if we change our video file uh, once more. And then we are already at 301 megabyte. And you can imagine at companies that have hundreds of developers working on projects with thousands of files, of large files, Git repositories can grow even faster to even greater size. And, um, and this is a problem. Um, and, and why? Because, see, when you clone a Git repository, you need to transfer all history, right? And if you have many engineers, then all these engineers need to transfer the history to their local machines, so they need space on their local machines, and they need to transfer uh, all the data through your company network. So basically, if you have large Git repositories and many engineers, you will um, need a lot of bandwidth. 
and that's one of the biggest challenges that I've seen in, in my company that, uh, that, that, uh, that impedes the, the, the adoption of Git. And um, Git LFS is a way to solve that problem. So how does Git LFS solve the problem? Well, let's look at the very same situation, but with Git LFS enabled. So again, we add some source code files and we add our large video file. So Git LFS will detect this, um, this video file and it will upload it to an LFS server. And the file itself um, is not added to the Git repository. Instead, Git LFS will add a pointer file that is very small, usually just three lines, um, that will contain just the location of the um, large file on the LFS server. So in total, after the first commit, our repository has only a size of one megabyte with the source code. And this might sound complicated, but Git LFS handles all these uh, things for you. So for you as a user, you would interact with the Git repository um, as you would normally interact with um, any normal Git repository. So if we change again our mind and change the color of the video file, then um, we add the video file to the repository, Git LFS will detect that, will upload the file to the LFS server, and will adjust the pointer file in our repository. So after the second commit, our repository still has just the size of one megabyte. And of course, this is also true for the third commit. So as you can see, if we clone, if one of our engineers clones this repository, then only one megabyte of data needs to be transferred. But of course, if you clone this repository, you have these pointer files on your machine. So on checkout, Git LFS will actually detect that there are certain pointer files that you want to have right now, and it will resolve these pointer files. That means it will download the actual content from the LFS server and place it on your machine in the right location. So that means if we clone the repository and check out the master branch, then we would need to transfer 101 megabyte in this example. And that also means we don't need to download the two previous versions. So in just this simple example, we already saved 200 megabyte or 60% of um, the bandwidth. And you can imagine if you um, have large, large repositories in big corporations, then uh, the, the bandwidth savings are even greater. So this is kind of the schematic view, how Git LFS works, but how would you use it as a user? So let's look at this. Um, here we have a normal Git repository. We have uh, one source code file, code CVP, and one readme file. And now we generate our large video that we add, that we um, place in our directory tree, tree here. So the first thing that we need to do is, and we only need to do this once, is we need to tell Git LFS what files should be handled with LFS. And we do that by using the git lfs track command. Usually, people use it in that way that they um, define a certain extension uh, to track with lfs. And this is an important detail. Um, files are tracked based on their file name with lfs. So the file size is not really relevant. Um, this is a consequence of the way how git lfs is integrated into git. So when we call this git lfs track command, what will happen is git lfs track will generate a .git attributes file. This file contains all the, um, contains all the, um, the, the, this file helps git to understand what files are actually tracked with lfs. Um, so after we have, uh, we have created the, the, the after we track the, the files, then we can just add then we just can just uh, use the ordinary git add command to add our files to the staging area for the next commit. And one thing that is important here is we not only add our video file, we also need to add the git attributes file to um, preserve the, the knowledge of what files are tracked by LFS. And of course, then we make our commit as we would normally do, and we push our changes to the server as we would normally do as well. So that's it. That's how you add files to git LFS. So we at Autodesk, we use Git LFS. Um, and we use it for more than a year now. 
very successfully for um, pretty much all our development. Just to give you a little bit of a perspective, so who is Autodesk? Autodesk is best known for AutoCAD. This is, um, and we, and AutoCAD is 2D and 3D computer added design software. We are in business for more than 30, 35 years, and we have more than 4,000 engineers working on hundreds of products that consists of terabytes of code and asset data. And we use Git LFS mostly for integration test data. In our case, these are mostly 3D models. We also use it for auxiliary data, that is documentation, images, videos, and that sort of thing. Some of our teams use it even for build artifacts. Um, these are like, you know, compiled libraries and, and things like that. We don't recommend that because we have a special solution for these kind of build artifacts um, that's called Artifactory that we use to, yeah, that is a central place where all um, compiled binaries are stored within our company. So we don't recommend to use, we don't rec recommend our engineers to use Git LFS for build artifacts. So as I said, we are using Git LFS for more than a year. And in the reminder of this talk, I want to share what we've learned so far. And I want to share that from a perspective of uh, two different personas. First, from the perspective of the developer, and second, from the perspective of the administrator um, managing the repository. So let's start with the developer. And with developer, I also mean you know, designer, tester, pretty much anyone who is interacting with a Git repository. So when I introduce Git LFS to a team, pretty much the first question that I get is, so what is too large for Git? So what files do actually need to go into Git LFS? And in order to, uh, to understand that, I want to explain it uh, a little bit further what files should go to LFS. <clears throat> in general, files that do not compress well should go to LFS. Why is that the case? Well, Git is made for text, for source code. So if you have a large text file, let's say a 10 megabyte XML file, that might not be a problem for Git because Git compresses all content and a large XML file can be compressed very well, usually. So if you add it to your repository, your repository probably won't increase in size that much. However, if you add uh, um, a 10 megabyte video file to your repository, then Git can't compress that video file any further because it, video files are usually pretty uh, highly compressed already. So that means if you add 10 megabyte video file to the repository, your repository will grow by 10 megabyte right away. Um, but you might say, okay, 10 megabyte, that's not, uh, that's not that, uh, that big of a thing, so uh, that's not a problem. That's true. But if you change this 10 megabyte file every day, then you would add 10 megabyte every day to your repository. And after a couple of weeks, you probably will have, uh, already, uh, will have uh, a problem already because your Git repository grew to a, an unmanageable size. So the bottom line here is files that do not compress well and change frequently should go to LFS. And in order to simplify that for our engineers, I also tell them don't worry about files that are smaller than 500 kilobyte um, because they are usually fine and um, that's not a problem. All right, so now you know how or what files you, uh, you should put into LFS. Now let's talk about how you track them. Um, I showed you earlier that usually people use this star dot extension uh, pattern to track files in Git LFS. And that works usually pretty well, but there are extra cases. So let's consider uh, you have a couple of big screenshots that you will add to your repository, um, maybe for the help pages of your application. Um, so you see these big PNG files and you think, okay, I track them with LFS, like that. And after you've done that, you realize your repository got a little bit slower. So what happened? Well, it turns out you edit your very large screenshots to LFS, but you also added your 10,000 small icons that your uh, application has to LFS. And this can be a problem because as I showed you earlier, LFS adds some kind of indirection um, in, your, in your Git process. You have this pointer file in between, right? And this indirection that causes, um, you know, requires more computation, so it slows down things a little bit. 
and you would notice that if you have um, yeah, well over 10, 15,000 files in LFS. Um, this got recently uh, much, much faster. So with Git 2.11, um, I, I helped to, I, con I contributed a new way how Git can talk to LFS and that made the communication around 80 times faster. So usually you shouldn't run into these problems anymore today. Um, but keep an eye on it um, because if you have really a large number of icon files in that situation, then, then that could be a problem that you need to watch out for. But what, you, what could you do um, if you run into this kind of situation? Well, one idea is to use smart tracking patterns. You don't have to track the extension of a file. You could add like a custom thing like, like .lfs. into your file names and then track this .lfs. Um, pattern like this. You could also um, just create a directory and track all the content within a directory um, in that way. And of course, you could also track the files by their name directly. Um, I generally don't recommend that because if you rename the file or if you move it to another location, then you wouldn't track the file with git lfs anymore and the content would actually bleed into your git repository. That's something you don't want. Okay, one more thing to know when you track git lfs files is that the, the tracking of lfs files is usually case sensitive. That's because in git usually everything is case sensitive because it comes from Linux, right? Um, so the thing is, on Windows and macOS, you wouldn't notice that. Because Windows and macOS, by default, they have file systems that are case insensitive. So if you track the lowercase PNG files, on Windows and macOS, it would also track the uppercase um, PNG files. But on Linux, it wouldn't. OK? So what can you do about that? Um, or in other words, this can be a problem for cross-platform um, develop teams that work on cross-platform software. So what can you do about that in this case? You could use glob patterns to tell Git LFS to track the extensions in all kinds of variations, like this. <clears throat> and when you use that glob pattern, then you will track the uppercase PNG files correctly on Windows, Mac, and Linux. And if you are unsure what files are tracked, then you can use the git lfs ls-files command to check what, um, what is being tracked. All right, now a few gotchas that our developers have run into. So the first one is um, when you have a lot of files in git lfs, then your git clone operation will get slower. And the reason is that uh, right now, um, git clone can download LFS files only in a sequential manner. So if you have 10,000 files in LFS, git clone would go and download each and every file uh, one by one. And that takes a long time. So um, that's why um, I teamed up with the GitHub folks and we came up with this git LFS clone command, which will speed up these clones dramatically by processing these files in parallel. Unfortunately, yeah, this wrapper command is still required. Right now I'm working on a patch for git core to make this wrapper command obsolete. So hopefully this, uh, this gotcha and this tip will go away soon. The next gotcha is that you as a developer, you should set up your git credential helper. Because when you use git lfs, then you actually make at least two calls to the server. First to the git server, and then um, on the checkout process, you would call the git lfs server. And if you don't have set up the credential helper, then you would need to enter your password um, multiple times, which um, can be annoying. So set up the credential helper and get to um, go around that problem. Third, um, as I said earlier, git lfs um, it should be used for files that do not uh, compress well. And these are usually binary files. But if you use git lfs for non-binary files, for text files, you run into this kind of problem that git lfs does not perform line ending conversions on files. So what does that mean? Let's say you add a text file to git lfs that looks on macOS like this. 
And um, if you check out this file on Windows, then the line endings will be broken because uh, Windows uses another line ending format um, than Mac OS and Linux. All right, the, the next gotcha is um, sometimes, or if you, if you don't, if you, one of your engineers in your team does not set up GitLFS correctly, then you might end up with these kind of messages. That basically means that in the Git attributes file, Git knows that certain files are managed by LFS, but um, Git LFS can't find the pointer file. Instead, it finds the actual content of the file. So the content is in the Git repository instead of the LFS server. Um, yeah, in order to fix that, just add the file again um, with uh, a properly installed Git LFS, and then that uh, problem should go away. Okay, now let's look at um, at our learnings from the perspective of the administrator of a repository. So our first learning is set up Git LFS properly on all dev machines. That's super important because if you don't have LFS installed on a machine, then your engineers will only see these pointer files. And of course, they don't make sense, and then the engineers will be confused. And also, as I just showed two slides ago, um, if LFS is not installed, then the engineers might add large files to the repository instead of Git LFS. And in order to make this, um, to make this setup easier for a large um, company like, like we are, we came up with a tool that we call Enterprise Config for Git, which is kind of, um, it's, it's, it's a tool on top of the Git config mechanism that checks your Git installation and makes sure that Git LFS is installed, that it's installed in the right version. Um, and if it's not installed, then, then it will install it and will configure it properly. Um, next topic, the versioning. So Git and Git LFS are both very active projects. They, um, they, are, uh, they are constantly in development and, and, and every new version brings, um, brings uh, speed improvements and bug fixes. So you should really um, distribute the most recent versions to your developers um, to, be, to, to make sure that they have the best uh, experience. The next tip for the administrator is configure a file size limit on your Git server. Because sometimes, especially in the beginning, people are not yet, or the engineers are not yet familiar with Git LFS and they might add accidentally large files to their Git repository. And you can reject them on the server so that you can ensure um, that the engineer um, is being made aware of the mistake and that the engineer gets the chance to fix the problem and add the file properly to Git LFS. So in summary, um, what are the takeaways here? Well, first of all, Git LFS solves a real problem. It works at scale and it makes large Git repositories work. Um, use smart tracking patterns to track exactly the right files with Git LFS. Speed up your clones with the git lfs clone command, at least right now. I hope this will go away soon with uh, my upcoming patch. And last but not least, reject large files on your git server. So that's it. Um, do you have any questions? What if you've already done a bad thing and you have a repository that has lots of large files in it? Is there an automated way to recover from your mistake and migrate to git lfs? Yes, there's a Java application, it's called Git LFS Migrate, um, that would basically fix that. You, you would tell this application what kind of files you want to have in LFS, and then it would process your entire repository, put them into LFS, and put the, the tiny pointer files into your repository. There's one catch, though. When you do this kind of thing, there's, um, then you would rewrite the history of your repository. So every commit has changes. So don't do this kind of thing lightly. You really need to communicate that to all your engineers, and it needs to be um, um, it needs to be a, a, a planned operation. I would say. Yeah. Okay. I think. Do we have more time for questions, or should uh, we are we are at your twenty five minutes? Uh, so okay. As, uh, as he's setting up, that you could unplug. We can yeah. start the Christian setup. There's the Twitter handle. If you have uh, questions, just ask me there, or just approach me here. Thank you. I think while he's taking, once you have your microphone off, are there, if there are any more questions.
Hello everyone.